I was gonna change, but then honestly, this is a much more realistic depiction of what I normally wear here in the sewing room while I'm sewing, which is my nerdy shirts that I wear around the house. So today we have a very oversized Empire Strikes Back t-shirt from the thrift store because I love a Star Wars t-shirt, but I don't like buying new t-shirts. But luckily there's so many of them that now they're at the thrift store, so men's department for the win. Hello there, welcome back to the Closet Historian and back to my sewing room where today I'm going to be answering your sewing questions. So things might be a little bit more informal and chill today. I hope you don't mind, uh, including, you know, the pajama this of it all. Um, but I had a few frequently asked questions that I've just put it here at the top because they get asked all the time. And one is, what are those scissors? Because I think people see me using these giant paper scissors and they're like, what the heck are those? Um, you could just use normal scissors. There's no, I don't think, particular reason to use these. But these scissors, uh, the reason I have them is because they came with my freshman year design kit in fashion school and it had a pa pair of scissors, which I still have, uh, before I had my iridescent scissors, which I also get that question asked quite often. Uh, my rainbow iridescent scissors, those are from Mood Fabrics, so they have those. I think they're from a company called Pink something? I don't remember. Um, Tula Pink, that's who it is, I think. I, I don't quite remember. These are them, they have them at Mood. Um, so that's my other scissor question that I get all the time. But the big ones were in my fashion kit. Um, these ones are PGM, which is a dress form company and sewing company. Um, but they also do have them at Atlas Levy, which is the same place I get my pattern drafting paper, which is another question I get often is where did, do I get my Alfred Numeric paper? I get mine from Atlas Levy. Um, some people have been shocked when I tell them that how much it is to ship that paper. Like the paper costs less almost than the shipping does. Usually the shipping's like $50 or something ridiculous. But it's because it's a very heavy roll of paper. Um, so it's just like heavy and large and awkward for them to ship because my roll it's probably like 45 at least inches tall or 50 inches wide the paper is and it comes on a big cardboard roll and it weighs like 50 pounds like it weighs it weighs a lot okay probably not 50 pounds but like 30 pounds at least this big roll of paper so it's expensive for them to ship so um just kind of think about the price of the paper as with the shipping and then know that like if you are doing any pattern drafting um like it takes me several like two or three years to go through a roll of that paper and that's me and i do pattern drafting like every other day maybe at least like i'm always doing pattern drafting and doing examples for all of you and things like that so it takes me ages to go through a roll you'll probably need to buy like one roll for your lifetime um if you're like a normal like human person and not like a weird sews too much kind of person and then the other very frequently asked question that i get um anytime i show my sketches um is why do you put a slash in the face of your sketches and I think people think there must be some sort of like artistic reason but but there isn't <laughs> um, actually a lot of I've noticed a lot of fashion designers do this in their sketches so um, I think Vera Wang her sketches usually have this Nicole Miller does Monique Lullier they have the slash through the face it's just because when you learn how to draw the croquis which is what a fashion figure is called it's like a it's like a normal figure and then they just make make it a lot longer they stretch it out um, long and thin just like fashion likes it you know um, but when they teach you to draw like the face, you draw like a line down the middle of the face and then you draw like the eye line and like the line for where the lips are when you're trying to draw little faces. And so a lot of times you'll just draw the eye line and like that's it. So you're just like suggesting where the eyes are. And that's kind of how my sketches started having that. I don't know, it just looks finished to me when I'm doing a sketch like that. Sometimes I'll do it at the start, sometimes I'll do it at the end. But it's just like a, a thing that I do. It doesn't have a, there's no reason that I do it. There's no like existential like something, you know, being said here. There's nothing poetic about it. Um, I'm not the only one who does it, apparently. Uh, not that I'm anything like, you know, Vera Wang, but um, I guess in this one thing we have in common. I had some questions from over on Patreon as well, and Lacey asked, um, you seem to be good about completing the sewing project that you start. Have you ever lost interest or become frustrated with a project and made the decision to not finish it? Do you keep these projects to revisit later on or do you prefer to just get rid of them and move on? And then other people have asked me, uh, similar questions about staying motivated to either start, like getting motivated to start projects or staying motivated to finish projects. And the answer to all of these things is twofold, I suppose. One is this is kind of my job now. And by kind of, I mean, it is my job now. So like I like my schedule for the week for my work is like to make this dress. So either I make the dress or I don't have a video to put out and I'm failing at my job. So, you know, one way I motivate myself to get my sewing done is that it must be done, it is my work. Um, so if I'm not feeling in the mood to sew, it doesn't really matter because it's what I do now. So I just kind of have to do it. So that's one way I, and I guess you could kind of like 
fake this for yourself. You could like give yourself fake deadlines being like, okay, I'm going to meet up with my friend for dinner on this day, which I know this is easier in a non panini world, but like say you were going to go to dinner or it was your friend's birthday and like use that, you know, n not necessarily it's like a actual deadline where it's like, I need my wedding dress by my wedding, but like you just use that as a deadline and say, okay, I need to have this dress done by that so I can wear that then kind of a thing. You can like make fake deadlines for yourself. Technically, because I am my own boss, all my deadlines are fake too, but they feel very real to me, you know? I, whether I'm feeling motivated or not, I have to start. And that's not actually, I guess, bad advice too. If you really want to do something like in, in your, you know, at peace state, <laughs> you want to do something, but when you're like tired or like distracted, you're like, ugh, am I really gonna start that today? Or am I gonna watch another episode of this? Um, you know, just say, even though I don't want to start anyway, and then hopefully by the halfway in, you will have become motivated, like you'll kickstart yourself, either that, or at least you'll have gotten a few steps done anyway. So I don't know, it's hard for me to answer this question just because I am extremely self motivated anyhow. And then I have also jobified my sewing. So uh, that helps me get it done and get it started as well. But the other half of the answer to this question is that I don't have to sustain motivation very long for any particular project. Because I, I don't, it doesn't take me that long to finish them. That's why costuming is the greatest challenge for me. It's because I have to stay motivated and stay involved for several days at a time. Because when it comes to sewing projects, usually I finish them very quickly. And so I, I only have to stay motivated to do that project for like a day. I'll give you timelines for how long it takes me to make things when I'm not filming them. So for a unlined dress with just facings to finish it, um, but like with a zipper in the back and a hem and all that jazz. It probably takes me about five hours to do that. If I was making like a simple cotton sateen dress or something. For a fully lined dress, it'll take me like 10 to 12 hours. Like ideally with like breaks, probably like 13 hours total. And I will still go ahead and force that all into one day sometimes. So sometimes I'll make something and I'll like start at noon and finish at midnight, that kind of thing. Um, so for like a fully lined dress and like some interfacing and nicer stuff going on, top stitching maybe, it'll still only take me like 12 hours. Um, and then, but like for a skirt or a shirt, that is again, more like a four hour project for me, like to make a pencil skirt, it's probably like four hours, which is why costuming is a challenge and which is why I don't lose motivation or like set a project aside and forget about it because I just push through until, and then I can't, I can't go to bed until I'm done, you know? But normally I do spend a full two days on sewing projects that you see at least because uh, the moving the camera around, resetting it up, resetting up the lighting, um, that all takes extra time. So that means that a project that would normally take me 10 hours will take me like up to 30 hours. And so I have to split that up over several days, usually two full days of sewing and filming at least, or two and a half, and then another two days maybe for editing. So it takes me like a lot longer to make a sewing video than it does to make a sewing project. And then Lauren asked me, what do you recommend for people who are intimidated by their sewing machine asking for a friend? I am the friend. But in reality, Lauren, you are asking for a friend as well because several people ask me similar questions to this. Like what if you are kind of afraid of your machine or if you're used to hand sewing and you want to make the jump over to your machine. So it seems like a lot of you actually are intimidated by the sewing machine. And again, this is, I'm noticing a pattern with your questions actually is that it's kind of hard for me to answer because I have to like pull myself out of my long time sewing mindset because like the first time I used a sewing machine was when I was like 12. So I've been used to like a machine since I was like 12 or 13. And so like, to me, I'm, I think the machine should be afraid of me, if anything, especially because I sew over pins so often. So there's always a risk that I will break the machine as opposed to the other way around. But I think you really do just kind of have to spend time using the machine. That's the only way you're going to get comfortable on it is spending time with it. And actually in fashion school, my school I went to, they made you do this whole booklet of, you had like a whole list of like a hundred different little samples you had to make. So practicing, every time type of seam finish. So you had to do French seams and regular seams and um, curved things and different kinds of points, different angles of points and how to cut them and trim them. And um, I remember the one that everyone had a really hard time was you had like a square, two squares of muslin and you had to sew a like maybe a five inch diameter circle and you had to sew a quarter inch of a way like this perfect circle to the center. I'll flip through this book for you and put it here in this video. So you can see my sample book from ages ago from 2009. <laughs> A long time ago um, so you can see what but I mean by this but I think you really just have to sit down with it and get used to it grab some scrap fabric or muslin and just have at it uh, practice sewing straight lines practice sewing curved lines um, see what the different stitches do see what the different attachments for your machine do 
read through your manual, I suppose. But it, yeah, it is hard for me to wrap my mind around this just because lucky for me, I've been using a machine since I was a kid. This is the second time I'm filming this Q&A, by the way, so hopefully I can be less rambly, but we'll see. Uh, because the first time I filmed all of this, I had lipstick on my teeth. So I'm really hoping to avoid that this time. Um, here's hoping. Ollie asks, what are my plans for costuming next? A bustle gown again. Yes, another bustle gown, I know. But this time, uh, trying to do kind of a more budget-friendly version. So I kind of want to, now that I've made the ultimate dream silk gown, I kind of want to make one out of quilting cotton. Um, so I may be doing a quilting cotton bustle gown later in the summer, like late summertime. And then I do want to do another big like silk project in October. Thanks to my patrons, I'm, I'm hopefully we'll be able to do something like this again, because of course the only reason I was able to do the silk project the first time was because of their help. But again, I hope to do another project in October, kind of like a Halloween. Seems a good time to be doing costuming, although this time I will start earlier so I won't be on such crazy deadlines because, well, let's hope. Let's hope I've learned my lesson, but knowing me. Eh. So hopefully a cotton bustle gown later this summer and then an 1890s project in October. These are in a very kind of random order, so sorry about that. But Cindy asks, what are my favorite fabric retailers online and in person? Which in person, there's not a lot of fabric retailers to choose from. Um, I live in Colorado and uh, we have Joann's. We have some like more like quilty kind of shops and smaller independent fabric stores, not a ton. Um, the one I can think of that is nearest to me is called Fancy Tiger Crafts and they have some fabric, but again, it is mostly less apparel focused. They do have some nice things. It's just a small selection. It would be like a fluke if I found anything there, I think. So mostly all we have here is Joann's. There's one more fabric store called Allen's, um, which people like to tell me about, which I always think is funny because I worked there, so I am aware of Allen's. Uh, it's more of a bridal fabrics and special occasions fabrics kind of focused store, but they also have millinery and hat supplies. So if you are in the Denver area or you come here often from surrounding states or things like that, um, hitting up Allen's is a good place to go if you like vintage things also because they have a lot of dead stock fabric from like 25 years ago and a lot of dead stock hat making materials because the shop before it was a fabric store was actually a hat shop. It's like a very like mom and pop kind of like family run place in the sense that like you will find like a roll of fabric underneath a bunch of other silks that someone hasn't seen for 15 years and no one remembers what they paid for it so they kind of just come up with a price on the spot for you so like sometimes things are priced interestingly there if you're looking for a like in a like almost like a gift project to yourself i think it's a good place to go and find like, something really special but you may have to pay a little bit more for it there uh, most of my fabric shopping i do online and because I never shut up about them. And by the way, no, I'm not sponsored by them. Most of my fabric shopping I do with moodfabrics.com. They are a family owned company. Uh, they're like a bigger company or known name now because of their association with Project Runway. But when they decided to do that, they were just like a smaller company. They used to only do wholesale and then they opened up to retail. And now of course they do a lot of retail business and they do still mostly work with smaller designers. They do sometimes sell, like resell fabric from larger designers. They'll buy fabric off of designers, um, stuff that didn't get used off cuts. Um, like I was talking about in last week's video and um, but they have a lot of new fabric as well they do print runs of their own I think they like uh, a lot do a lot of digital prints like the sateens I buy I think there's a lot of in-house design from them on new fabrics and I just like moodfabrics.com I've never bought a fabric from them and been disappointed in it and they are actually mood fabrics is pretty good about in the description of the fabrics first of all they'll have like the width of the fabric and they will have the weight of the fabric which you kind of have to know your fabrics a little bit to be able to use that information but it is still good information to have. And then they will sometimes in the description of the fabric, they'll say, this would be great as a blazer or like suiting. Or they'll say like, this is a little bit sheer. So we recommend one of our linings, things like that. So they'll let you know a little bit more information about what the fabric would be good for, which is good if you are newer to sewing and you need that kind of uh, guidance, I suppose. And that's actually another question I've gotten before is how much fabric do I need for this? And like insert dress, skirt, blouse, or like a project that I've made before. And it's like, it's impossible for me to tell you because fabric comes in different widths. So for a pencil skirt, if I had a very thin width fabric, if it was only like 40 inches wide fabric, I would need at least two yards because I would have to cut the front and the back like along the length of the fabric. But if I had a fabric that was 54 inches wide, I could put the two pieces next to each other. So I'd only need one yard of fabric. So it depends on how wide the fabric is and how wide your patterns are, how much fabric you're going to need. So it's very like custom questions. So it's like, how much fabric do I need for a dress? <laughs> It depends on both how big your dress pattern is and like how it needs to be laid out and how wide the fabric is. So really 
paying attention to the fabric width is quite important here. Other places I have shopped with online, of course, are Etsy. I've bought vintage fabrics and like dead stock fabric on Etsy before from various sellers. My favorite one is Stevie Saint Fabrics, which I will link to them below. And I, I do, they only have so much stock, so I feel like they're my secret source for rayon crepe. So don't abuse that information. Let me have the rayon crepe first and then you can have some, okay? But I bought vintage fabric on Etsy before and of course I use Etsy to shop all the time. Um, and then I've never bought fabric on eBay, but I'm sure you can. And I have bought from fabric.com. The only, like I like fabric.com. I've had a good experience with them. They just are owned by Amazon. So I try not to shop with Amazon as much as I can. Again, sometimes I need things overnight. Sometimes I can't find something anywhere else. And then I will shop with them because it's not like, it's, they're not the worst company to shop with ever, but they're not the best as we know. So I do my darndest to not shop with fabric.com, even though they do have some very nice things like that lemon dress I made here recently. That fabric was from fabric.com, but they're like a, it's a good resource. It's just, you have to be okay with shopping with Amazon, which ooh, this video is going to be long. Dang it. Kelly asks, what do I prefer to buy versus what do I prefer to sew? And really I have zero. Oh, there's actually, now I think about it. There's a couple of things that people ask me to make all the time that I'm like, I would never make that. And the first one, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Everyone is gloves. You're not going to catch me making gloves. That is some fiddly nonsense. Like I cannot think like never say never in life to quote Justin Bieber or whatever, but I, I do not want to mess with that. That's like, so I don't even know how you would sew that on a, a machine. Like I, do they have specialized machines for making gloves when they make them like in a factory setting? Because I don't know how you would get around all the little, no, I'm not, I don't, I will torture myself for a project, but not like that. Um, it's too fiddly for me. So I will not make gloves. I don't really have any interest in learning to make lingerie. Um, eventually we are going to make a slip here on the channel, but that's like going to be like my Christmas present to you. So you have a long wait coming for that because I'm not excited about doing that either. But, um, I don't really have any interest in making lingerie because if I spend a lot of time on a project, which as we all know, I don't, I spend one day on something, but one day is a long time to me because it was one day I could have been writing. Um, so if I spend time on a project, I want to be able to s it to be seen. So if I make something that goes underneath everything and no one sees it, but me, not really into that. So I have no interest in learning to like make bras or uh, like anything like that. That's, that's a lot of architecture and it's very advanced. It seems very advanced to me. So I'm not interested in doing that. So lingerie, no gloves, no suiting is the other thing that I don't make. I just buy it. Um, and when I say I just buy it as if it's easy, um, I collect 1940s and fifties suits, the amount of layers and tailoring and nonsense that goes into that is way beyond my skill level. Uh, I think that's a qu another question I'll have later on is like, what something do you feel is like beyond your skill level or you haven't tried because of that reason? And it's like proper tailored suiting. I just don't know how to, I don't know how to do that. Um, I never took a tailoring class. Like when it comes to like hair canvas and like padding and like built in shoulder pads and stuff like that, I don't know how to do any of that. So I would like to learn one day. But as of right now, I'd rather just buy suits, which again, they are hard to find. And especially in my size, because there are a lot of smaller suits out there, but finding ones that have, and like, especially in suiting, you want enough ease. So like I have a 30, 31 waist measurement, like in my resting state, but, um, in a suiting jacket, I try to buy with a 33 to like 35 inch, probably maximum waist. Um, and to find suits in that size is harder, but I just collect over a long period of time and don't expect to like have a collection tomorrow going to take 10 years, which is how I built up my glove collection as well for the same, the same way. And people say like, um, I have large hands. Like I need to learn to make gloves because I can't find them. And it's like, well, you say that, but I've done it. Like I've built up a whole rainbow of gloves in a size seven and a half, eight, which is my larger glove size. So it can be done. It just takes more time than anyone wants to have it take. If that makes any sense. Natalie asks, when does one use an angled side dart as opposed to a dart that's level with the apex? And we're going to, I think I'm going to make a whole video about dart manipulation, just because I feel like there's a lot of dart misconception or misunderstanding going on out there. But like when it comes to the darts in the front of the bodice, you can move those puppies anywhere you want. And there's not really, I mean, you can use, it's hard to explain because like, there's no reason to use an angled dart or a straight dart or a like vertical up into the shoulder, into the armhole, into the side. There's no reason for a dart to be anywhere it needs to be other than if there's something going on with the rest of the design. 
you can move those babies anywhere. They all, like, darts radiate from the cone on the front of the bodice, the bust usually, especially when it comes to the front of the bodice. So you can move them radiating from anywhere from the apex. So there's no reason to use an angled versus straight dart. There's just, it's just up to you. It's a design choice. Um, so sometimes you'll see me move a dart up into the shoulder and people will be like, why did you move the, the dart to the shoulder? And it's just like, I felt like it. <laughs> like it was just, I, I liked it in the sketch. Like it, you just, you can move them, you can split them. Um, that was another thing. I, a couple of questions I got were like, I only have like a two dart bodice and I want to have a third dart. Let's say you have like a waist dart and, and a side dart and you want also a shoulder dart for some reason. You just like close half of the one of the other ones and open it up over here. Um, or if you only have like one big waist dart and you wanted to add a side dart, you just close, like cut in from the side to the apex and close half the fullness out of the waist dart to open up a dart in the side. Um, so I'm gonna make a whole video about manipulating darts because I do it all the time here on the channel, but like, I guess we need to like understand like the physics of like why darts are even there. And some people ask like, why darts? And it's like, it's just how fullness is controlled to contour the front of the bodice to the body, like the curve of the body. So I think I'll be getting into darts more soon and doing a whole dedicated video on this subject. Josie asked my favorite and least favorite fabric and the reasonings for why. And then she also asked about skirt hemming. So I'll get to that in a second. My least favorite fabric to work with is Rayon Bemberg lining. I love the feeling of it. It feels very nice against the skin, but it's like very silky and smooth, but it feels like trying to sew with like flowing water. It's like, the most slippery and annoying textile to work with ever. I think like silk is easier to use than that. Super lightweight silky things are not fun to work with, especially if like for some reason you need to cut them on the bias. Um, so those are my nose, um, but my favorite fabric to work with, big shock, ready? Everyone hold your breath. It's cotton sateen, that's right. Um, I think a lot of people, when I say cotton sateen, imagine that I mean there's no stretch in that because I don't work with stretchy knits, but cotton sateen is still a woven fabric. A lot of times, especially at Mood, it will have a little bit of elastine or spandex in it. So the weave of the fabric is a blend. Um, so it has a tiny bit of stretch. Like it'll, on Mood, it'll say like 10% width wide stretch. And it's usually width wide stretch. So you cut it so that that stretch goes across the body this way because you wouldn't need to stretch this way. But if you have a big burrito, it's nice to have a little bit of stretch this way, you know? But like the standard cotton sateen from Mood, um, the one that they seem to have digital prints done on all the time, I love using that fabric. I, I feel like you just cannot go wrong with a cotton sateen. They have a cotton sateen at um, Joann's that I really like using as well. Again, it has a little bit of stretch in it. It's in their like bottom weights section, the small section of apparel fabric that they have at Joann's. Um, I really like that fabric as well. And you can get, of course, the nice thing about Joann's, you can use a coupon. So you can get it for like $6 a yard with a coupon, which is always nice. But yeah, cotton sateen is my number one fabric. It's washable as well, which is nice. You can just throw it in the wash. It's not like a rayon crepe where you have to get it like dry cleaned or something. So Cotton sateen is my, my number one favorite fabric. Oh, and she asked, how long do you usually let your skirts hang before hemming? Is it possible to let them hang for too long? I don't think so. Other than like, you might lose motivation in the project if it's been sitting over there for too long. But like the principle behind leaving a skirt hem to hang before you hem it is because the fabric, the weave of the fabric, you know, it's over under like this. And if a fabric is woven tightly, like very tightly, there's not a lot of space in between the threads for them to pull out of shape. And if you're working with something that is loosely woven or like a very flowy kind of fabric, there's more space in between the threads. So when you hang it, it will like pull a little bit. Uh, the threads pull on that and like sink into that space that is there. So the more tightly woven a fabric is, the less time you have to let it hang before you hem it. And the more loosely woven a fabric is, the more time you're gonna wanna let it stretch out before you hem it. Um, and also like if you're cutting, let's say you have a pencil skirt, or even like a gathered skirt where it's like just a straight cut of fabric. So again, the weave is straight up and down. Uh, you've cut it on the straight grain or the cross grain as opposed to on the bias. Um, as long as you cut something on the straight grain, like a pencil skirt or a gathered, like a standard gathered skirt that's like a rectangle gathered down that's on the straight grain, that's not gonna stretch into any weirdness. Um, the only reason you would let that hang is maybe because like, if you let it hang because all the threads are facing the same direction, it's gonna stretch the same amount across the whole skirt. So that's fine. Um, so it might stretch out a little bit if you want to like, if you're very sure you only want that to be 29 inches long and not 30, then let it hang first. But for me, I, I do not care. Um, so if I have a pencil skirt or anything that's cut straight cut, I do not let that hang at all. I just immediately hem it, especially because again, I like to finish projects in a day. Um, but if I have a circle skirt, 
part of the circle skirt is cut so on the straight grain and part is cut on the bias and the bias is always going to stretch a little bit more than the straight grain areas same with an a-line skirt like an a-line skirt if you put it on the fabric when you're laying it on the fabric you're cutting it along the straight grain for like the center portion of the skirt but the sides of it because they start to flare have a little bit of bias in them and they could stretch a little bit um, so it really depends on the weave of the fabric and it depends on the cut of the skirt how long you want to let something hang before you hem it but because I most of the time do not use very loosely woven fabrics, I usually don't let my hems hang. If I make a circle skirt, I will, because that's the one time where I've like been burned by not letting them hang. But I, if even A-line skirts, unless I'm using a super loosely woven fabric or like a rayon chalet, which has a lot of flowiness to it, I don't hang them. I just hem them immediately. I'm naughty like that and I'm way too lazy. So I don't, I, I don't even hang my hems that often. I just know that you're supposed to. So I try and be good as like a teacher to tell you what you're supposed to do sometimes, even though I break those rules, you know? All right, I have a lot of questions like this and it's how to grade or size up a vintage pattern or any pattern. And bad news is the reason I haven't shown you how to grade a pattern is because I don't know how. Speaking of fashion school, you know, they didn't teach us how to grade at any of the schools I went to, or like if they did, it was like hidden in some sort of a class elective that I didn't have. Um, so I don't know how to grade patterns. The only time I ever almost came close to grading patterns is learning how to do it in CAD software, which obviously isn't helpful because who has really expensive CAD software laying around and like a scanning board and stuff like that. So I don't know how to grade, so I can't tell you. But here's the thing. I don't think you need to grade up your vintage patterns. I think you need to have a basic block that fits you and then use that block to make the same design as the vintage pattern. And again, this is something else that after I actually, the nice thing about this Q&A is it gave me a lot of ideas of what I need to make video, whole videos about. So again, I'm going to be making a whole video about this soon where I go on a nice little rant about commercial patterns. But every time you buy a commercial pattern, let's say every company has a different amount of ease, you're going to have to make a mock-up and adjust it to fit you right and then you make it a real thing. What, why do that when you could just have your pattern that you know fits you and use that to copy the design? So if you have a vintage pattern, it comes in a size 10, you're a size 18, you need to size it up. No, no, why don't you just take your pattern that already fits you and copy the design and then it will fit you. Hopefully you can kind of see what I'm saying. I'm gonna make a whole video about this soon. So I don't know how to grade patterns. So I'm sorry, I cannot teach you, but also I don't think you need to know how to grade patterns. I think you need to just make your basic fitting shell pattern set and then copy every design you ever could ever want. And then you don't even have to buy patterns anymore. You can just look at the pattern envelope and copy the design over. I'll get you there. I'll try my best to teach how I do this. Several people asked about sewing tools and like what tools I think are essential or what ones I think are not essential. Um, just sewing tool questions in general. Um, and I do have an entire video about my, all the different tools I use here in the sewing room where I just kind of went around to each of the stations that I go to here in my sewing room and talked about the main things I use at each station, like the rulers I like, the scissors I like, the different things I like to keep here in the sewing room. And so I will go ahead and just put a card up to my sewing tools video here. Um, I think, again, the most non-essential tool, the tool that everyone seems to think that you need to have, that you do not need to have, is a dress form. I think that's, especially if you're a beginner, and like, unless you're going to start learning how to do draping, which is considered a more advanced skill, and you don't need to do to do pattern drafting either, to make, make your own designs, you can do flat pattern drafting, which is what I do. You don't have to do draping for that either. So uh, I just don't think dress forms are necessary at all. This is a soapbox I am happy to stand on. Betsy asks, what are some simple patterns to get started with drafting and get used to it? I want to get into pattern drafting, but I have no idea where to start. Again, I'll be covering that soon here on the channel because the, I, like, if you're asking me this question about sewing as opposed to pattern drafting, if someone said to me, like, what are some good beginner sewing projects? I would say a pencil skirt because you have to practice a waistband, darts, a zipper, lots of things, good things to practice in a pencil skirt. But as far as like, what are some good beginning pattern drafting design like um patterns the the you have to make a pattern set like a fitting shell a basic block bodice block and skirt block before you can do any other pattern drafting so you have to start with that so like if you're a beginner and you don't haven't done any pattern drafting before you're gonna have to start with your basic pattern set whether you like it or not and what's unfortunate about this is that the basic pattern set and making it fit you properly is actually the hardest thing to do in pattern drafting and then everything else after that is easy so you have to get over the mountain but then you are in this very peaceful nice valley so again we'll talk about this more soon robina asks what sewing books would i recommend or would be good for learning about garment making um i didn't use books to learn about sewing i don't think books are a good way to learn about sewing 
And like for some people, they might be because if that's how you learn best, then fair enough. But for me, I didn't learn to sew from books. I learned to sew from other people and from and that and, and that mean I mean people who taught me physically in the same space as me, which is hard in a panini, I know. But you could spend money on a book or you could spend money on like one sewing lesson with like a local seamstress. And I think it'd be more it would be better to spend thirty dollars on an hour with a seamstress walking you through how to work your machine and do a couple of things with that than it is to buy a book on sewing. There are a lot of free sewing books online as well. So if you ever like I don't look at I don't want a book on about how to sew. I want in the middle of a project to know how do I sew a double end darts and Google it. Um, so I think, you know, each technique is Googleable. You'll find a lot of different blog posts teaching you how to do different things from different seamstresses. So you'll have a wealth of different ways of doing things. I don't really believe in book learning for sewing, unfortunately. Um, there's no sewing book that I've ever used or turned to. The only book I use all the time, and I think someone asked about what pattern drafting books do I recommend? And that is just my textbook from school, which is Pattern Making for Fashion Design by Helen Joseph Armstrong, which you may have heard me mention before. Some of you have told me that you have bought it because I've recommended it. So I hope you're having a good time out there. And I'll never see that cut from the publisher, but get in touch if you're out there. So that's the only like book I really recommend, but even that is a pattern drafting textbook. So it doesn't teach you how to sew the things. It'll teach you how to like make a pattern for something, but it doesn't tell you the steps on how to make and sew that. But I really don't think books are the way to learn about sewing. I think watching videos and having someone or having someone like actually teach you in the physical space, which again, I know we're in a pandemic right now, so um, that's hard. But uh, if you, you, know, you have a friend whose mom still sews or even someone who is like a quilter, they probably wouldn't mind like teaching you how to use the machine at least and things like that. So um, I think it's better to find like one or two physical classes and go from there. Camille asks, how do you take care of your antique sewing machine? I'm really scared of breaking mine. The nice thing about antique sewing machines, especially if you've got like a big cast iron buddy like mine, is that it's cast iron and like machined metal. So it's gonna be really hard for you to really mess those pieces up unless, I don't know, you can like breathe fire or something because those those parts are stronger than you are. So it's gonna be hard to break them. The thing about modern machines is that the parts are plastic. So there's much higher risk of you messing something up permanently in a modern machine where you could like bend or twist or break, crack a plastic part. Whereas on these old antique machines, they're all metal parts and so it's hard to break them, at least in my opinion so far from my, I mean, this is, I've only been using this machine for a little over a year now, my 1955 uh, Singer 99K, but I've had zero problems with it. I just give it a little bit of oil on the bobbin, um, like race, I think it's called, inside every time I sit down to use it, especially because I live in a very dry place. But as far as my maintenance on that machine, I like clean the fluff out of it, not often enough, every few months, and I put oil in it every once in a while, but I don't do a ton to maintain that machine. It just works. Uh, I think the old cast iron buddies are the best now. Like I never thought I would want an antique machine, but whew, have I been converted? Uh, especially cause you could pick them up. Like my 99K was $75 on Craigslist and it works like a dream, which is a lot cheaper than a lot of entry level, like plasticky sad machines these days. So I highly recommend getting a vintage machine either from like thrift store or Cra Craigslist or your friend's grandma or whatever, because I think they're a lot harder to break, honestly. I really do want to answer all of these, but I just know this video is going to be eight hours long. Oh, here's a, here's one that you didn't intend to rile me up again. And also, I just want to make a note here to say that I'm sorry if it came off as super defensive, my last video. I do think that is a good question, by the way. Like, how do you make your sewing more sustainable? And like, sustainability is always a good question to be asking about. I wasn't saying that you guys who asked that question are haters. I was just anticipating people being mad at me for saying that I don't like home decor fabrics or like anything like that, and then being mean to me for the last video, not in advance. I don't think questions about sustainability are, are hate comments in any way, shape or form, by the way. Um, I think that's a good question. I just have an impassioned answer and therefore I had to make a whole video essay about it. My apologies, but this is another one where I'm like, why? <laughs> and like, it just frustrates me, but it's not your, it's not the question askers front, but uh, queering underscore traditionalism asked, have you ever tried one of those vintage dress cutting systems example, wholesome? And like, I do not understand the purpose of having a special dress cutting system or like a like uh it's like a fad diet to me it's like i don't need adkins i just need to be healthy <laughs> like or like i it's like i don't need wholesome i just need to learn pattern drafting like i don't want to learn someone's special way with their special rulers and it's like i'm gonna use my regular ruler and just learn pattern drafting like i don't need someone's special pattern drafting i just need regular pattern drafting you know I don't really understand all these vintage dress cutting systems. I feel like it was just a way to market 
pattern drafting to people that maybe seemed less intimidating for some reason? I don't know. It seems like you can't just learn to cook. You have to use such and such as cookbook. It's like, no, <laughs> like just learn to do cooking. Like I don't, so I, I, a lot of people are like, I wish you would try this system or this system. And I'm like, why? why? Just learn pattern drafting. It doesn't make any sense to me to, you, to use someone's special formula and their special rulers and their special like geometry. Nah, man, I'm just going to use regular pattern drafting. Why make it harder than it has to be? A silver fox in Tasmania asked, what's one thing you wish you knew when you first started sewing that you now know makes a big difference? And the answer is pattern drafting isn't that hard. I didn't know that before I went to my first year of design school. Like I was very worried going into fashion school that pattern drafting was going to be hard. And then I got there and I was like, oh no, this comes extremely naturally to me. And I do think there is some element of like, it just comes naturally to me and some element of like, they made it sound harder than it was going to be. It's a halfway thing, but I wish I knew pattern drafting. I wish I knew that was like the answer long time ago because I had a lot more trouble with, and like a lot of like, when we're talking about like things like, what do you do when a project frustrates you or fails? I haven't had that happen to me since I've been using my own patterns. Like using commercial patterns is where things are like, huh, you get to step 12 and you're like, what? Or like, uh, there's way too much ease built into it so it doesn't fit at all or weirdness. Like, I just think making your own patterns is the answer. And again, I acknowledge making the first pattern set and making it fit you is the hard part. But after that, it is a smooth sailing, you know? I like this question because it makes it seem like this must look like it's polished from the other side. How do you organize yourself to sew, voiceover, film, and edit and never miss a deadline? I do miss my deadlines. A lot of times, actually, and this is such an unfortunate situation, uh, my Patreon sewing video will be a day late because I'm trying to pack it all in. So a lot of times I'm, the deadline I miss in a month is usually the Patreon. My Patreon, um, my, I do an additional pattern drafting and or pattern drafting and sewing project video over on Patreon every month. And it's supposed to come out on the 20th, which is again, a false deadline that I set myself, but it's supposed to come out on the 20th. And a lot of times that one will come out on the 21st because I'm struggling to get it all done in time, but uh, I'm glad it looks like smooth sailing out there. But a lot of times I get the project finished and I get it all filmed, but then it's like, shoot, I don't have any time to edit it. Um, but I just don't sleep, you know, that's the answer to that. And I also asked like more of like a fun question, which is if you get married one day, will you make your own gown? Um, and probably not, honestly. If I ever got married, which would seem a rare enough thing in itself, just because of who I am um, and where I'm at, currently seeing as at 30 I still haven't started dating so give me some time here um but I think first of all I personally wouldn't like like a big gown involved wedding like my ideal wedding from my like if I could ever find a human would be that I like am interested in marrying would be like a courthouse like a nice vintage suit courthouse going to dinner somewhere nice with like 10 people max that's like my ideal wedding. So like making a gown, it would only be ever if like the person I was marrying wanted to have a big wedding and I'd be like, okay, well then we'll go ham. And, but still, I think even then, I don't think I would make my own gown just because I feel like big events, especially as an introvert are stressful enough without me thinking like, this is going to be the one time that I like used rotten thread and my zipper breaks open will be this time, you know? So uh, I just think I would rather buy a dress for such a stressful situation. Although I don't, I don't like a lot of bridal wear at all. I think a lot of it is like literally hideous. So uh, that would be a struggle for me, but I would probably just buy a, I would just buy a special vintage dress and like, it wouldn't even have to be white cause I wouldn't care at all. Um, cause I'm not, whatever wedding this would be, it would be very non-traditional no matter what. So I, but I think I would buy an ensemble rather than make something for my, if I were to ever get married. Che Burger asks, do you have any tips for buying fabric online? This kind of related to the earlier uh, fabric shopping question, particularly for those of us who are new to buying fabric. And again, I got so many questions kind of similar to this. I got so many, like mo the majority of questions are about like how to choose fabrics. So we're gonna do a whole separate video on that coming up here soon because it's a big topic and this video is already long. Smelony16 asks, was fashion school worth it in your opinion? Um, is it worth it to go back to school for? If not, how do you get started in that field? And then, they have a lot of questions about darts, which again, we're going to talk about darts in a whole separate video soon. Um, was fashion school worth it in my opinion? No, <laughs> not even a little bit. If you are, if you want to go into fashion in any way, shape or form as your career, 
you are going to have to be incredibly self-motivated and passionate about it. People are stomping above us. And you, if you're going to be incredibly passionate and self-motivated, you might as well learn on the cheap than pay for a degree program. Because in a degree program, you're going to have to be really self-motivated. And out of a degree program, you're going to have to be really self-motivated if you actually want to get the most out of things. So like, why have debt if you don't have to, is my moral of that story. So I guess maybe some other time I'll do a whole video about my fashion school experience and why I've came out of it thinking, why the heck did I just waste that much money? Like my entire school experience in general, because I went to a private school my first year and then a state school the other three years, but I did study abroad. So like all total, it probably was like at least a 50 or $60,000 investment. And I still have a lot of debt. Uh, most of that is debt that I have still now, at least 50 to $70,000, I would say total. Um, and for 50 to $70,000, better to get a small business loan and actually like take it an entrepreneur class, take it like a night class on entrepreneurship and then <laughs> teach yourself the rest and then use that money to start a business. So yeah, no fashion school isn't worth it unless, unless you get into Parsons, Pratt, Central St. Martins. Those are the three probably top Parsons and Central St. Martins are probably the top fashion schools for like actually breaking into the industry afterwards because they have the most contacts and like working in the fashion industry is way more about um, networking and having the money to be able to work for free, honestly, than it is about skill or talent or hard work even. I mean, you're gonna have to hard work hard no matter what, but like if you can't afford to work for free, it's gonna be really hard to even get networking because fashion, inter fashion internships are mostly unpaid and that is mostly how people get hired to work in like designer level and like get their start in like designer level fashion. It's because either they have enough money to start their own line and promote it, or they work with someone for a long time and like learn the ins and outs of the business. And the only way to get started working for somebody else is agreeing to work for free for a little bit. So you have to have enough money to not have to not work, which is, you know, part of my whole rant on this whole situation of like both fashion and museums is that you have to be able to work for free, which means that anyone who can't afford to do that is like left out of this whole entire system. So not into it, but yeah, no, I don't think you need to go to university for fashion design at all. Any of the skills, like any of the, the basic skills you can learn elsewhere. They don't often have the specific skills like tailoring or like fitting. They don't usually even have those at school. It's like fashion school, especially like state schools. Like I went to a state university that had a fashion program, especially that they're like basically training you to go do like CAD for Gap or like to do fashion merchandising at an already established like Macy's. Like they're not even teaching you to be a buyer. They're not teaching you to do like fine tailoring, all that kind of stuff. You're going to have to specialize yourself anyway. So why? You can take fashion class. You can take sewing classes at like Joann's for a lot cheaper than you can at a university. And I recommend it. I would like to apologize to this person, um, Miss Dandelion, because they said, uh, um, do you have any advice for fashion students entering the industry or going to school life advice, I suppose. And I feel like I already answered this question in like the worst way possible, which is like, don't do it, which I'm sorry. If you're already in it, just know that I was there as well. I, I did the whole thing and now I'm still paying for it. So. There's that. <clears throat> but they also asked if I have any tips, general experience to share on millinery and perhaps making vintage accessories. I did take some millinery classes. Like I do know how to block hats and make hats a little bit more properly than just like the average home hat maker, I suppose, because I've taken some millinery classes when I was studying abroad in London. Um, so I've taken some proper millinery and we can do some proper millinery here on the channel soon. I actually, actually, I just invested in a very expensive, thank you patrons, hat block that is uh, known as a puzzle block, which means it comes apart. And so we're going to play with that puzzle block here on the channel this year, later this year. Um, but we can do some blocked hats, um, which is how most hats are made, which is why it's hard to do like hat DIYs that aren't just like buy a headband and glue feathers on it, which it's like, yes, we know. But like real hats are often blocked and the hat block therefore is the bar is the barrier here because not everyone has hat blocks. In fact, they're quite rare these days. Um, so there are cut and sew hats we can make without hat blocks, but this is the biggest like hurdle to get over is a lot of different hat styles require a block in that shape, but I will be doing a lot more hat making on the channel 
uh, going forward here just because a lot of people have shown interest in it and I also really like hats. So we'll do some more hatting here on the channel soon. Molly also asked, do I service my own machines? If so, is servicing hard to learn or do I have tips? If not, how often do I get my machine serviced? Um, at least this Singer, since I've had it, I've only, I did a service on it when I first got it. I never used a 99K or a vintage Singer sewing machine at all before, but the minute I got home with that thing, I just went online and typed in like how to change the oil or like how to oil a Singer 99K. And I got tons of videos on YouTube showing how to take every different part of them apart and put them all back together, clean anything, replace anything I needed to. So YouTube videos is how I learned to service my machine. There's people who will totally walk it through you and just, you know, you can just, I set my machine right here, actually. This is where my computer is, my desktop. I set the machine here in front of my desktop, push the keyboard out of the way, and I played the video of the dude taking apart a machine, and I just paused it every few seconds and took, and like did every step with them, <laughs> and to, that's how I serviced that machine. Um, I had to take the tensioner all apart on that and put it back together correctly because it was a little bit off. And I just followed along with the videos online. Most machines, you can probably find a video for servicing them. I would say even better for vintage machines than new ones um, because a lot of people service old machines and a lot of people have videos about it, weirdly enough. So I think you can learn to service your own machine. I don't think it's that difficult. If you're having a major problem with it or something is broken, then fair enough, bring it in. But especially with these old old machines, pretty easy to service yourself, honestly. Ray asked, do you clip the curves of French seams and do you apply rayon seam binding before or after sewing the seam? And I like these questions because I can answer them quickly. Do you clip the curves of French seams I have no idea because I just don't use them. I'm sorry. Uh, I th Google will be able to tell you that one, but I personally have no, I, I assume you have to, unless you're using like a very narrow French seam, especially because like on a French seam, usually you sew wrong sides together and then you trim. So in that trimming, I think it's like the same as uh, what clipping would give you. And then you s turn the right sides together and sew it again. So you have to sew it twice, which is why you don't catch me doing French seams because like you have to do everything twice. I don't got time for that. I want to finish a dress in a day. But the other question of, do you apply round seam binding before or after sewing the seams? I try and remember to always <laughs> put it on before, especially because um, some people do stay stitching, which is another like proper sewing thing where you actually like do a line of stitching to help a neckline not stretch out or something like that. Um, which again, something you won't catch me doing because it's just an extra step that I have never found necessary in my own sewing, but it's probably good for beginners. Putting the rayon seam binding on before things get like stretched out and moved around too much is probably a good thing. But I just actually made a dress. I just made two dresses that involved rayon seam binding this last weekend. And uh, I tried to remember to put all the rayon seam binding on before I sewed everything together. Clueless Vintage Gal asks, how do you keep all of your current and future projects organized? Um, and I know what I'm sewing next because it's on my work calendar. So like I have a calendar of all the videos that I have coming up and I can like rearrange them if I need to. It's not set in stone stone, my video calendar, but I have my videos and projects, like main projects, for both here and Patreon and personal projects even usually planned out about a year in advance. <laughs> so uh, like I know all my videos that I wanna do planned out through about next May, about a year out. So that's how I know what I'm sewing next is because it's on my calendar. Um, but uh, the other way I do this is like when I add fabrics to my stash, which I shouldn't be doing, of course not, but guess what? shiz happens. Um, I usually know what I want to make out of something, especially like when, if I'm buying something, I know I'm going to buy a one yard to make a blouse. And so I, it sits in there and I know I'm going to make a blouse. And usually I have a vague idea of what kind of style of blouse I want too. So um, I guess I have a pretty good visual memory for this kind of thing. Someone asked me, uh, probably people asked me too in my hat videos recently, like, how do you know what hats are in each box? And it's like, I just remember, or like how many, how do you know what hats you have? And I just have like a catalog in my head. And I feel like it's the same way with projects, like it's just in here which is not very helpful or replicable. So sorry about that. SS underscore S Brina asks, I wonder if your mom helps with your projects in a consultant or opinionated kind of way because she had the serger machine and I suppose she influenced you. Who do you ask for advice? Um, my mom and I have extremely different fashion si style sense. So I don't really ask, well, also I'm a very opinionated and set in my ways person for better or for worse. So uh, I, I only really follow my own opinion in life. Um, someone could tell me they wouldn't like something and I'd be like, that's nice. But like, mm, my mom and I have very different opinions on fashion, movies, music. She likes, I think, the things I make most of the time, but 
Uh, she wouldn't wear them. That's for dang sure. Um, she had the serger machine for like a very specific project that she was like obsessed with for a minute and then never used it again. So like that's how I yanked the serger machine. Uh, my mom doesn't sew anymore. She did when I was younger. She would make like outfits for my brother and I when we were little or Halloween costumes. And then I wanted more costumes than my mom was willing to make. So she was like, guess what? You're learning to sew so that I don't have to do this anymore. Um, so then I quickly like at like age 13, 14 started uh, getting more advanced in my sewing than she had ever delved into because I wanted to become a fashion designer after a certain point. So um, I think I can sew better than my mom. Sorry, mom. <laughs> but uh, she definitely like encouraged my sewing when I was little and she knew how to sew when I was younger, but she doesn't sew anymore. And I don't really, the only thing I ask for her help on is zipping me up in and out of dresses or buttoning things. People, that's another frequently asked question that's not a sewing related one. People ask me how I button my button back blouses and it's like, I just don't live alone. So the few I can't reach, I find a person to, to button or zip me up, you know? And seeing as this video, again, it's gonna be eight centuries long. The last one I'm gonna have uh, time for today, I think is, are there any um, tips and tricks you have to make your clothes look less homemade? Is it, about, is it about fabric choices or order of construction or anything else? When I sew things, they always end up looking costumish or not as professional as I would like. I do think a lot of this comes down to fabric choice. Um, just because like, if you have the wrong weight of fabric for the style, like if something is too stiff or too flowy, things can come off just looking a little bit off. Um, and so I think a lot of this will be solved by talking about fabric choices soon here in a dedicated video. Um, and the other thing is like always making sure that you clip your curves and clip your corners and things like that so that things lay and press smoothly. And the other thing is pressing. So like pressing your seams as you go along. Once you sew the side seams, press those open flat. Shoulder seams, press those open flat. Making sure you're always pressing your seams properly is going to give a more crisp, professional look and finish in the end. But I do think, you know, a lot of this is fabric choice. I think that's a good assumption. I think it's correct because like, for example, I hear, I've heard a lot of, um, actually on my last video, even people saying like, well, I still use quilting cotton to make clothes and you can, but like a dress, if you make the same exact dress in quilting cotton and in cotton sateen, the cotton sateen one is going to look more like a store-bought dress just because quilting cotton has a certain like quiltiness to it. Like it, and like, especially after you washed a couple of times, it gets this like fuzziness to it that is a bit more blankety. And that's why when I when I use quilting cotton for things, I'm, I'm not allowed really to use quilting cotton rule that I made for myself for clothes anymore. Um, I try not to because I don't like this uh, kind of worn in look it gets after a couple washes. Um, it does look a little bit more homemade. Um, so this effect is lessened if the fabric is a lighter color. So lighter colored like ivory or white background fabrics for quilting cotton, I think is fine. But like if you have a black quilting cotton it looks nice before you wash it, but then afterwards it does start to look a little bit blankety. So that's another thing where it's like, I think this is a fabric choice thing. And if you have like a house dress or like something super casual or summery, I don't think that matters at all. But if you're trying to make like a nice dress to wear to like work or something like in a business environment, like a quilting cotton is never gonna be the way to go. You know, hopefully I make some sense here. We're gonna talk about fabric soon. Like I've said, sometimes the design itself just might be kind of costumey um, as well. We could be lending to this. So like choosing something that's a little bit less the stereotypical might help with this a little bit too. I have a whole video. I'll put a card up to this video here where like how to, feeling costumey and vintage and like how to what kind of avoid that. So I have a whole video about that as well. But when it comes to making things not look home sewn, it's like the more experience you have and the more experience with fabrics you have, the less this is gonna be a problem, I think. Uh, I wish, I, again, it's another one where I'm, it's hard for me to identify if my things don't look home sewn, why that would be, I suppose. <laughs> So hopefully I was able to answer quite a few of your questions. A lot of people had similar questions. So if I didn't answer your exact question, hopefully I answered something similar to it or adjacent to it. And then again, I'm gonna be making some specialized videos on certain topics like fabrics, like sizing, grading patterns, or AKA making your pattern that is your size and then using it to make everything you would ever want. Things like that. So I'm gonna be getting into it uh, and a couple other videos answering some of your questions in a more long form way. So if I didn't answer your question today, it might be because I want to make an entire video about your question, which is how the sustainability video happened last week as well. Um, I do, again, I think those are good questions um, to be asking. I just, uh, sometimes I get questions like, like for example, the sustainability question, like, have you ever thought about the sustainability of your sewing? And it's like, I went to fashion design school. Like I had to write papers about that stuff. I had to go to textile lab class. Have I ever thought about it? 
of course I have thought about it. Like, um, I literally decided to not be a fashion designer because I knew it was unsustainable. So like those kind of things, they do like hit a little bit of a nerve on me. And that's not the question asker's fault. It's just uh, because A, I'm a little bit sensitive about it because what I do is and um, is antithetical to my worldview. Yes, uh, I make and consume and buy more things than I should, which is uh, not something I, you know, believe in when it comes to like saving the earth. Like these are two things that are at a contradiction and therefore a bit nervy. But I try and just be honest about that, and I think I'm not the only one. You know, um, and this is like the other question that's like this for me all the time is when people are like, "Do you know about Amazon self-publishing?" And it's like. Yes, I'm aware that self-publishing exists. Therefore, there must be a reason why I have no interest in it, um, which I've talked about inside Hustle and before and stuff like that. But like, it's another one where it's just like, like, it's not the question asker's fault, but it does make me extra sassy, you know? So sorry about that. But thank you again so much for your questions. And if you have any more questions for me, some of these are like really specific and like kind of one-off. So I'm gonna try and go back and answer some of them where it was like, how do I do this very specific thing? And I think I'm gonna go ahead and try and answer some of your questions. But if you have any like random specific questions for me or vague questions as well, always feel free to leave those uh, for me in the comments. I'm happy to answer questions in the comments. Sometimes it takes me like a week to get to comments, but that's just because there are so many and I have more things to film and sew and make and do and all the things. So um, sometimes I get behind in comments. I'm a little behind right now, but I do try and get to them eventually and answer your questions. Thank you as always for watching this video today. And I will see you back here for more vintage fashion and sewing real soon. Bye.